Welcome everyone, thank you for joining us for part two of this e-assessment webinar series with Associate Professor Alan Clough. So last time I introduced Alan, um, I told you guys he is the coordinator of a staff development cluster at SILT and he teaches on courses uh, ranging on topics from educational psychology, um, educational assessment and adult education. But I also want to share that regionally, Alan also teaches on courses, uh, courses on assessment design and academic literacy. Uh, his research interests include the use of theories and principles of dynamic assessment to facilitate student learning and in the processes of staff development as literacy, such, uh, literacy's practice and induction into professional learning communities. Alan also contributes to the development of educational assessment policy in the further and higher education sectors nationally. Uh, if you want to read Alan's full bio, you can find it on our Emerge Africa event page. So Alan is a super busy guy and we're really excited to have him join Thanks very much, Nicola, and hi again to everybody, wherever you might be. Um, I'm not going to go through what we covered last week in part one in any kind of detail, except to say one or two sentences, and those are really, firstly, that what I tried to do in the first session was give an overview of uh, what I believe to be the macro, meso, and micro systemic factors which act either as affordances or challenges to the use of online assessment and, and to, to its practices. So what I'm going to try to do this afternoon is move much more into the specifics around what I think online assessment as a practice can offer us. Um, I'm going to talk necessarily in some cases at a fairly general level about in relation to assessment as an activity anywhere, but I want to I want us to be thinking all the time. What is it in particular about the online space that that enables us to um, make use of assessment as a practice, and for what purposes? Um, I want to draw first of all focus or start by focusing on assessment in its widest sense, um, but only as it applies to the assessment of student learning or student work. Um, it would be too wide a topic for us to talk about assessment in general, because in my view, the assessment is any kind of act of judgment which we might make. And that takes us into a, to, to a domain and a realm that is far wider than, than this webinar is going to be about. So what I want to concentrate on then just to repeat is issues related to the assessment of student work and then in particular looking at the distinction between or, or, or what particularly online assessment online as a platform enables us to do in assessment terms i also want to make make us have us think quite carefully about the continuum of assessment from perhaps highly informal forms of assessment right through to very formal forms of assessment and to think about assessment in in, in very wide ways so i'm not only for example going to talk about assessment as an assessment of writing, writing, for example, but also I want us to be thinking more widely around the use of assessment in oral settings, perhaps group processes, uh, case studies, integrated assessment, issues of authentic assessment will hopefully also come up during the course of the afternoon. And we can, we can reflect on some of those in the course of the webinar and beyond. Uh, it's gonna be quite difficult, obviously, to cover all these topics in any kind of detail. So um, the, the chat room, the chat uh, text area is going to be quite a useful resource, I think, in the space of this hour, plus also beyond the space. And what I'm going to do um, organizationally is stop roughly every 20 minutes and ask Nicola perhaps just to give us some idea about what some of the key themes are which are emerging from the chat room and about which I can then perhaps offer some comment or other people uh, can offer comment. We will then move on to the second part and then the third part. And I'm going to invite people to continue to engage in the chat uh, as we go along. Um, and possibly beyond the seminar, we can look for opportunities to respond to, to questions and issues which come up. 
So let's get right into it, and I'm going to start with a fairly, um, I suppose, provocative quote. Um, can I just check, are these slides visible? Uh, you should now see in a slide which says, does assessment matter? Good. Okay, I'll continue on, on the assumption that the that the slides are visible and that my audio is also is also audible unless I hear anything to the contrary. So Graham Gibbs back in 2010 um, in his work and he's done a lot of work in uh, based at Oxford Brooks Cole University Oxford Brooks University um, focusing on assessment and the practice of assessment in in classroom in higher education classroom settings makes a very uh, extreme claim that assessment makes more difference, as he says, to the way that students spend their time, focus their efforts and perform than any other aspect of the courses they study or in course they study, including the teaching and so on. And I'm, I, I'm not, I, I want to be clear, I'm no sort of assessment evangelist, if you like, um, in, in suggesting that assessment is the be all and end all of, of education. But I do think that Gibbs makes a very important point in terms of its influence on the quality of student learning that might occur, um, either in formal or in, in, in informal settings. Um, I think, yeah, let, let me move straight on to what I would like us to be thinking about this afternoon in the next hour. I have three focuses in this particular webinar. First one is what may initially seem to be self-evident, the idea of turning course objectives into learning focuses, and this in particular for the purposes of developing assessment practices. So what I'm suggesting in my first point here is that we need to be strongly turning, if you like, our, the, our gaze from what it is that we as lecturers, teachers, course conveners and the like um, are attempting to do in, in our courses to what it is that we want students to be learning. So whilst, as I say, that may seem initially to be self-evident, it is a really, in my view, a really important departure point if we want to be clearer about the validity of our assessments. So in essence, what we're trying to do in, in assessment terms is surface what we think students are learning and then look to take those learnings back to what it is we want to achieve in our course objectives. So the first point then, is to suggest moving our gaze from a focus on ourselves and on our courses to a focus on the learning that we want to have students demonstrate. We understand that not all learning, of course, is demonstrable. It's not all visible, and neither is it necessarily always visible immediately. It may be visible at another point or later stage, and that it may also be multidimensional. So we can't assume always that what students demonstrate in the way of learning is entirely, if you like, the universe of what, they le what they've learned. But we do, but this kind of focus allows us to explore all those kinds of issues because we can then start, start asking questions about what it was that we wanted students to learn and to what extent what they produce in the way of evidence for that learning is consonant with what we had hoped for or expected or self-consciously constructed. The second point I want to emphasize, and this I think uh, relates directly to the development of online assessment practices, to th is for us to think about assessment in terms of a kind of level of, if you like, cognitive or affective or behavioral or anything else for that matter, like values or something of that kind, demand. And I know the word demand is pretty crude here, but I'm, I'm suggesting here that if we think about assessment as a practice, that focuses perhaps either on what students are thinking or the quality of students thinking, what they're feeling, how they are behaving, the kinds of values and professional attitudes that we want them to develop, or combinations of those, of course, because they're not necessarily discrete and compartmentalized categories. But if we focus on those things, we have a useful possibility for thinking more about what kind of learning are we trying to assess and how, again, how will we know it when we see it, as it were. So if we're trying to assess a level of thinking with students, we will want to be clear that the task we set them for assessment purposes is genuinely an assessment of a level of thinking. Knowing, as I said earlier on, that in some cases, these things are not separate from or separable from one another and that they might be interlinked, etc. What I think this also speaks to, by the way, and it's an issue which I also want to raise this afternoon, 
is it speaks to the que a, a question around the particular form of assessment that we develop. To give a very simple and possibly quite uh, sort of superficial example at this point, um, if we are going to set students an essay in which we hope that they will demonstrate a particular level of critical engagement and thinking, but the task we set them is focused entirely on them being able to re reproduce or regurgitate the knowledge that they might have learned in the class. We're not necessarily assessing for what we had hoped for or what we had thought we would be assessing. There may be other kinds of assessment, and here again, especially in the, in the uh, online space, that would more effectively represent the domain of the learning that we're trying uh, to, to produce or create for students. For example, having them participate in an online chat, a little bit like we're doing right now, or having them, for example, respond to questions in groups in an online setting, um, or perhaps um, doing um, analyzing case studies together in an online setting might much better represent the kind of uh, assessment or the, or the object of the assessment rather than, for example, some kind of, in this example, written essay. The third thing that I want us to focus on, third principle today focus, is, is looking at the extent to which student responses on any kind of assessment is genuinely evidence that the learning focus has been achieved. This in essence goes to the, the long held uh, or long, long um, venerated issue of validity. In other words, we're wanting to make an assessment and a judgment about the extent to which our assessment is genuinely valid. Is it genuinely measuring what we would hope it to have measured? So let's take this for a moment into the online space and think about what different kinds of learning we might be wishing to uh, find evidence for in an online space. It is very clear, I think, to me that, that the kinds of evidence that we're looking for goes way beyond simply students being able to reproduce a particular knowledge base. That may be important and it may be an important starting point. But in an online space, there are lots of other kinds of learning that we might want to be uh, producing evidence for in that, in, 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 in that kind of engagement. For example, the ability of students to work together in groups, the ability of students to provide feedback to one another in terms of what they're learning and our, and our intervention in their feedback. And then uh, Nicola mentioned early on my uh, interest in dynamic assessment, the use of highly um, intentional and sequenced forms of mediation in an online environment which we, in which we want consciously to shape students' learning through the kinds of questions we ask in response to the tasks that they are doing in online spaces. I'm going to develop these themes a lot more as we move along. I want to argue that in particular, in moving on to my next slide, I want to argue that in particular, um, online platforms and, and e-assessment provide us with very useful opportunities for developing in particular formative assessment. In other words, for offering students opportunities to learn, to develop, to grow individually and in groups and with others and with their peers and with other uh, and with le their lecturers in ways that will improve and facilitate their learning and that we're not necessarily so consciously um, focused in the online space on what, on what are, just, are characterized as summative forms of assessment. I think that there are challenges here. We probably will want to come back to some of those, uh, those uh, questions as we, as, we, as we go along, those issues as we go along in the webinar. It is possible to do summative assessment in online spaces. There are issues there that we may want to talk about, such as security, confidentiality, and the like. But for me, the online space is a particular space in which the affordance of formative assessment uh, can be can be developed to, to quite a high degree. So, so those are the three things I want us to look at today. Um, the question about what it is we want students to learn. The second issue about what kinds of what types of learning are we particularly focus in on, focusing in on, such as cognitive or affective, etc., etc. Learning, and then finally. The, the really key question, the question about how, how do we know that learning has actually occurred? In other words, and the argument I will make is, in essence, assessment is about building a weight of evidence argument, a weight of evidence argument that allows us to make claims about student learning.
So for example, if students have done a writing activity and they've also responded to an oral assessment and a case study and perhaps done some uh, group work in, on a task, when we sum those different kinds of learning together, we start to make claims about the learning that students have, have de demonstrated. We know, for example, the limits of that, of that claim, for example, we know that um, from their writing we may not be able to claim, make evidence or claims to evidence about their ability to get on with one another in groups. So these things together enable us to make some kind of, as I said, weight of evidence argument around learning. Okay, let's move on to the purposes issues now. Why do we do assessment? I've put up just a few possible reasons for doing assessment activity and I want to s separate, if you like, separate them out because they seem to, for me, to fall into or to have two particular dimensions, two, two categories of classification. One is the separation between formal and informal learning or the separation, if you like, between summative assessment and more formative assessment. And the other is more a focus on the extent to which assessment tells us something about student performance and then the extent to which the, uh, assessment tells us something about our own performance as lecturers or as assessors. So those two dimensions I think are intersecting. Um, the, the dimension between, for, the, the continuum between informal or formative assessment perhaps, and sorry, and formal assessment, and then the continuum between a focus on what assessment tells us about students and what assessment tells us about ourselves. So you will see, for example, in the slide in front of you now, that if our primary purpose is to check how much and what students know, we will create assessment tasks that are geared towards that purpose. So those might be, for example, assessments of students' levels of knowledge, uh, assessments about what they know from a particular course. And that kind of assessment, I think, can be very is very readily uh, accessible in online environments. Typically, students might be set uh, post-class tasks in learning management system environments or on other kinds of platforms in which they can engage with topics like what do you know, what, what did you learn in the process of this particular lecture or and, and they can give, they can provide pretty easy and quick feedback in online spaces in response to those kinds of questions. I think what the online space also helps us to do very nicely in those spaces is to be, to, the, is to have a record of how students have responded to those tasks and then be able to offer them mediation and feedback, excuse me, in relation to those, to those recordings and to what they've actually written in response. But I think also, and probably crucially, in the environment of social learning, students get to learn from one another in those kinds of environments as well. They get to see one another's responses and they get to respond to those to those responses. Other formal kinds of tasks that we might um, offer in an online space is, for, for example, grading performance or certificating, um, where students, for example, hand in formal assignments in an online space and we get to grade their performance that way. But often that kind of assessment does not necessarily, except for the individual student perhaps, provide much, for, much room for formative assessment or for learning for the student other than what they other than for them to get feedback on the actual task. I think that there are also very important um, focuses for assessment in, in issues related to our own teaching. Um, it's, it's often the case that when students perform poorly on an assessment task, we assume that it is the students who haven't learned well or haven't been able to uh, um, achieve what we had hoped they would achieve in the learning. It can often be, if we, if we think carefully and look carefully at the feedback we get from the task and know what the task was aimed at, we can often receive quite constructive um, uh, feedback um, about our own ability to teach and what we might do differently as a result of what students have produced in the way of, in the way of uh, assessment evidence. The key, the key interest for me in using uh, assessment to facilitate learning, and here I think the online space does provide us with lots of opportunities, is it lies in the use of, of feedback and mediation in the processes of learning. So if, for example, we set informal assignments 
in online spaces for students to respond to, whether they be, whether it be that they are responding to text or a video or something audio or some kind of case study or they're responding to some group process, for example. We have a real opportunity ourselves as lecturers, and I think students have that opportunity too, to enable really effective learning if we are clear, clear again, if we go back to my first slide, if we are clear about what it is that we're expecting to see as evidence of that learning from students. So if we know, for example, that our, our focus is on attempting to assess the extent to which students um, have developed, say, particular emotional responses to a, uh, to a case study, we need to make the focus of our assessment on that affective dimension and domain. And so it's not going to be any use in, for example, push, unless we think this is important, it's not going to be any use to push students into an analytical mode of thinking when what we're trying to assess is their ability to understand emotion or to uh, identify emotion in their learning, for example. <clears throat> there are other purposes for, learn for, for, for assessment, for example, to differentiate or separate or classify students, typically and arguably. Uh, one of the key reasons we do assessment at all is to be able to identify variation in students' learning. Why? Because that takes us, takes us along a continuum of being able to understand how we mediate the learning for different subgroups of students. For example, if we know that some students are struggling with a conceptual understanding, we can, we can see that in the feedback that, that their task provides. Again, in an online space, we can see it very readily because they're providing those kinds of, those kinds of um, items of feedback in, an, in a fairly immediate way. Other students can see those too and can, and can be assisted, if you like, to provide feedback to, to their fellow students uh, on the basis of what, what those students are saying or doing or thinking or feeling or the like. But the, the, the idea, as I say, from our point of view as lecturers is that we are able to see that variation and be able to subclassify, if you like, or subcategorize students' responses, not the students themselves, but their responses to an assessment task. We're able to classify them and provide much more intentional and effective feedback to them on the basis of either their conceptual misunderstandings or perhaps their inability to make application or perhaps to think or to reason in a critically reflective fashion as we might have wanted from, from the task. The, the idea of the, the second last point, the idea of promoting or modeling thinking, um, this is here I'm thinking particularly of the extent to which we can make use of model answers uh, and rubrics to enable learning to take place. And I think online environments give us really good opportunities to put up rubrics, um, to annotate those rubrics if necessary, to present model answers to students, perhaps different qualitatively uh, different model answers and to en enable students to think about and to engage in discussion and talking around uh, around the model answers. The rubrics um, are simply, I suppose, at one level, a reflection of our thinking about the assessment and what is assessment um, enables uh, and what kinds of learning assessment enables, but they can be very useful tools um, for us to make use of in enabling learning to take place. Finally, in this particular slide, there is a chance to use assessment as an opportunity for ourselves to reflect on our purposes, our aims, and our goals for particular courses. So that takes us back to my slide one, where we've moved from a focus on ourselves to a focus on what students have learned, and then a focus in turn back from what students have learned uh, to, um, to what we had expected and what our particular objectives were in either in particular yes. learning situations. Indeed, Alan. So Tony okay, had a I'm good one here, which I think John, John won, John's question ask, links to. But Tony Nicola, said, you have can a sense flexible of what is automated from the responses that count as mediation? Up on at this stage so things like the later online point. MCQs, and I know there are a lot of more sophisticated talk. tools and approaches nowadays as well, such as, you know, adaptive learning and that. Uh, John also raises the point of how do we uh, ensure fairness when using randomized questions from okay. a test bank. So, yep, sure. 
Okay, can we take those two questions together first and then we'll come back to the ones that are being raised, say, by Ant Antonio and uh, by you too, Antonio. Um, the, the question about automated and uh, feedback to students, I think, has some value. Um, it's, it's, it's certainly useful because it gives us an opportunity to think about what are the different possible ways in which students might be um, processing an assessment task and we can anticipate then what kinds of feedback we might want to do. But I think it is of limited value in the sense that unless we know more about our students, we are, we are likely to, we are likely to um, miss the target, if you like. We're likely, certainly at the individual level, it's going to be very difficult for us to provide or create automated uh, uh, responses to assessment tasks that, is going to, that are going to um, satisfy or, or reach every individual learner. But I think that they're an important first step. So they provide, for example, opportunities for us to begin to show to students that there are different ways to um, deal with particular assessment tasks and that they can, and if they are put up in some kind of online environment situation, it enables students to look at some of those differences and perhaps say to themselves, well, that's interesting. I had not thought, for example, that I was not understanding the, the fundamental concepts in this particular course, but I can see now that I did because of, of the feedback that I've been given. Um, Taken, t taken to the to its extreme, a dynamic assessment suggests, for example, that we that we tailor feedback to us to students' assessment on a kind of one-to-one -one basis. Now, that's simply, I guess, not practicable. It's not possible to do that, and it's certainly not possible to do that when we have massively massive classes of say 1,000 students. So there, things like automated and classified feedback could be useful, but I guess they need to be. Uh, springboards, if you like, for further engagement. Students can possibly in an online environment be given an opportunity to look at the different kinds of feedback they've been given and to respond to those. Perhaps group themselves with other students or we can do that kind of grouping for them to continue to learn or to gain more from the kind of feedback that is given to them. The in 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 the in the online space there there's a distinction made between by by the way between what is called computer-based assessment and computer adaptive assessment, which I think is what some people are beginning to refer to here in relation to fairness. It is possible to make use of highly sophisticated computer programming uh, to develop um, answers, sorry, to, to develop assessment practice uh, in an online environment in which the assessment itself is responsive to the levels of, of thinking and response that students make in the, in the previous bits of the assessment. So, for example, if students from their first responses in a particular task look to be struggling with, say, application to the real world, the computer will be able to offer to those students further items that have to do with um, application to the real world. Now, those, that's certainly not the substance of, of, of our discussion this afternoon, but I'm, I'm encouraging people to go and look at the field of computer adaptive assessment for more examples of this kind of work, because it's based on the assumption that in a way that students, that, that students demonstrate their learning through their responses to assessment tasks, and that, and that the succeeding assessment tasks that the students are presented with are based on a sort of adaptation yes, sure, of, Alan, think, uh, of what they have learned and, and enabling them to learn further. But as I say, we're not going to go into the, into the huge uh, detail around that feedback. right now. And then where do we, um, rather than can I pick up on the issue around formative online feedback space and the generally, use of online I think tools, a lot of us are wedded which I see you raised to particular in online chat. tools that we might like or find useful. Okay. So if you could share a little bit more about Mm. Mm. Okay, I'm not aware specifically of tools. I'm thinking more particularly about processes that I would encourage people to, to try out, to think about in the online space. It goes back to the question about um, being very clear about what students are learning and what it is that we want the assessment to enable. That's, that's uh, critical in this particular discussion. 
if we know what it is that we want students to demonstrate in the way of learning, we can tailor, in online environments, we can tailor particular questions or tasks or examples to suit those particular purposes. And that's how I think formative feedback can be best used. We can also encourage and perhaps in, in, um, uh, in require, if you like, of students that they actually uh, respond to the tasks in online spaces, which enables us then to do further mediation. Again, it may not be possible to do mediation one to one. It may be that one, on the basis of feedback that students give to particular tasks, we group students and we reflect back to them in online spaces what kinds of learning we see in the ways in which they've responded and we give them particular challenges based on those on those responses so that i think could happen in many online spaces it might be that students themselves can continue to 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 engage with the particular learning they have in in groups that we don't necessarily participate in so they can create their own facebook learning community they can create their own social media platforms in which to engage. I do want to make a point though about I think the, the overall purpose of mediation and feedback to students in these moments. It's, it's, it's useful I think to have students involved in giving feedback to one another provided that, that the students have good information on which to provide to, to base their feedback. So to give a, a sort of a silly example for a moment uh, if we're asking students to give feedback to one another about the way they're thinking in a particular task or a case study, for example, we, we, we do not want the students to be commenting at that moment on uh, the font that students are using to, to respond to the task. So we need to be guiding students, I think, in relation to giving feedback in ways in which uh, in ways in which they or that in which in, in ways in which they are enabled to learn how to give feedback. It's critical, and I think they can do that through seeing the way we give feedback online, um, through perhaps being given an opportunity to model that kind of feedback, through using rubrics, because rubrics also to some extent reflect a, a feedback, a kind of feedback that we're giving to students. So that enables students to engage much more meaningfully in the discourses of assessment. And the reason I'm making this particular point is that um, uh, the discourses of assessment, in my view, should be just as much a part of discipline engagement as the discourses are that relate to uh, the, the topic and the discipline and the concepts themselves. So talking about how to do assessment, talking about how to respond to assessment tasks and having a language for that assessment is absolutely critical if students are going to learn anything from uh, the assessment tasks that are presented or put in front of them or presented to them. Okay, um, let me just respond briefly to the question about students with disabilities and so on. I'm, I mean, I think I think this is a specialist research field, uh, and I think at minimum it requires it requires us to be making use of specialists in the areas if we're going to do this kind of work. I mean, for example, um, I have been participated in standardized assessment projects uh, previously. What we had to do there, for example, was in cases where, where we were working with visually impaired students, we had to make sure, and this is a validity question, we had to make sure that the assessment we had developed was accessible to students with visual impairments and had, and had come with the necessary, ad necessary adaptations. Another so we so what I suppose at a general level what I'm saying is that we need to be working in conjunction with our colleagues who have the, this kind of specialist expertise before we think about putting assessment activity in an online setting because there are particular kinds of literacies here including the literacies of engaging in the in the medium itself that we need to be aware of and working with when we develop when we develop the assessment I think I made the point last week that online assessment practices are not simply a matter of taking face-to-face -face assessment practices into an online environment. They require a consideration of all the kinds of literacies that are present, that students are presented with and that we ourselves are presented with in, in place in putting assessment tasks online. Um, I mean, just to give you a very particular example, not only is it a question, a sort of a technicist question of changing, of enabling the assessment to be accessible, for example, to specialist audiences, but also it, it means thinking about what 
uh, in learning terms happens when a particular form of assessment is placed in an online setting and is, is offered to, to students, for example, with, with say learning or hear, uh, with uh, visual or, or, or hearing impediments. The, uh, the issue, the, the, the example I give here is we, we discovered, for example, when we wanted to have a, a, a hearing uh, impaired student take uh, one of our assessments, that much of, of the language that that student had learned was not necessarily accessible, or rather was not, did not mean, meant that that student was not necessarily able to access the, access the kind of language that we had used in the, in the assessment setting. So we had to look at the, at the language of the assessment as much as we had to look at the purpose of what the assessment was supposed to be doing. Okay, and I think this question, Nicola, that you, that you raise is, is also very useful to say, to think about if we are going to take learning into particular online settings, which kinds of learners, for example, does this not enable? So what, for example, if we know that hearing, uh, hearing impaired students are not able to participate in the assessment, we need to think of different ways of doing it. But we also need to be considering validity issues as well. So the validity issues such as what is the assessment designed to assess and is it genuinely doing that? And I'm back to my third point on my first slide again. What is the evidence that we collect that enables us to make claims about particular kinds of learning? So if we're going to claim students have learned particular things and we know that they are specifically unable to access the assessment because they're hearing impaired, we cannot make the kinds of claims about their learning in the same way as we might do with students who do not have hearing impairments. Okay, um, I'm going to move on a little further. We seem to be running rapidly through the, through the hour um, into introducing a little bit more about this question about knowing what it is that we're trying to assess. I'm going to probably skip over this slide very quickly and say that what, what I think research on student learning has helped us to think about very clearly is exactly the point I was raising at the beginning. The question about what is it that learners think they are doing when they respond to a particular assessment activities. And so what this research of Martin and Salios did all those years ago, and it is now 40 plus years ago that their work was, was uh, current at the time, they helped us to understand very clearly that it was possible to alter the quality of learning through changing the assessment task. So for example, simply asking how questions produces a different kind of learning than asking why questions. How tends to focus, focus us on methods and processes and why it tends to focus us on reasoning and critical engagement. For example, I mean, I know I'm, I'm kind of flattening the nuances quite considerably here, but the question about if we change tasks, we can possibly alter the, the kinds of learning that students engage with. Okay, so here's a, a set of implications around that. If, we are, if, if our primary focus in learning is for knowledge acquisition, and this is certainly possible in online environments, we need to know what it is that we try, that what knowledge is being valued and why that knowledge is valued. So when we set assessment tasks, we automatically, it's, they are highly social activities, as I was indicating right at the outset of the presentation through my title. They are highly social activities and, it, and, and an assessment task is going to um, signal to students a particular kind of knowledge that is valuable or valued and why that is particularly valued is important for us. If our focus is on application of knowledge and procedure and process, we need to be clear about what we understand by application. In some cases, application is relatively routine and one-dimensional. In other cases, the application we're trying to encourage for students is highly multi-dimensional, complex, and transformative in the sense that it's expecting students to develop an application that they might not have been exposed to in class. And so, again, Putting tasks in online environments enables us to unpack, if you like, the task with students so that they have a clearer sense of what it is that is being expected of them in terms of learning. Same as understanding. Often here my colleagues equate understanding with remembering. They're not necessarily thinking about understanding when they ask questions like, do you understand? Or when they ask students to demonstrate their understanding in assessment tasks. And then finally, questions around transformation. And by transformation, I mean here critical thinking and critical engagement, not necessarily uh, referring to the, although this might be very topical and important now, 
to the to the debates around decolonization and so on. I think assessment though can play a very strong role in um, that because, yes, so because I think the mayor had a really interesting point very here. She's often in large classes what kinds of knowledge we include is a range of classes and we value it and who we draw on for our sources of knowledge. Okay. Anything, Nicola, that is is emerging now that is is might be worth discussion looking at and talking about a bit further. It says, but the Absolutely, uh, Samaya. I think there is very much a link. I also think that online spaces can help us not necessarily blur that distinction, but can help the informal contribute to the formal. So if, for example, in case study analysis and discussion, students do that discussion in online settings, uh, there's a possibility, for example, then to use those discussion points that emerge from the online setting to shape uh, their learning and their preparation for a formal task. Um, often, and I suspect that's what's happening here, when we talk about assessment, I've been saying right from the outset that assessment is not only a formal assessment activity, it can be highly informal, but and, it may, and these things may, may, may serve very different purposes. The informal kinds of assessment that we might do very often are highly formative. In other words, they are intentional activities aimed with or directed at the possible formal assessment which might take place either at the end of the course or at the end of a unit or something of that kind. But the argument for me is that in an online space we can be much more systematic about both looking at how students are responding to assessment activities and also shaping and thinking about the way they respond to those tasks as a contribution towards their preparation for a formal assessment. And that can happen, I believe, through both our own mediation and through the mediation of, of their peers and through the participation and collaboration of peers in those formative activities, provided, again, previous point that I made, provided that the, that the peers themselves have a good basis on which to make judgments about their fellow students' learning. So we need to be talking about those things. What is it that we want students to learn? What will be evidence of that learning? And how will we see it? And how will we be able to use that evidence to enable students to better prepare, say, for formal tasks? OK. Um, Yeah, I mean, this, Cheryl Belford, your point about reflecting uh, on whether the task has been successful, I think that is absolutely a core purpose of assessment, especially as a formative process. So in online spaces, those kinds of re records can be available and we can make use of them in very intentional ways to provide students with both feedback on what they on what they're learning and also to help us to think about both our own teaching and the ways in which we might shape uh, the formal assessment processes. Very nice ideas coming out here around as much as we give students their individual feedback, it also prepare, proves to support them with more holistic group feedback. Absolutely, I think that's a critical and a really important function of assessment in an online space. That formal, that informal assessment space helps strongly to contribute to students benefiting from both one another and from the feedback they get from ourselves. And of course, from 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 the, and and that learning goes way beyond simply learning about particular knowledge or particular applications into something where they, uh, I mean, it's that issue around the extent to which we're assessing cognitive, affective, and perhaps even behavioural um, levels of of ability just as much as as say or, or in 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 conjunction with one another. Okay. I want to move on a little further. We might not get, I don't think we're going to get through all that I wanted to cover in the single hour, but that's okay. Let's just try and focus a little further. Um, I wanted to just introduce this this map to you. I see that it's there have been a few uh, conversion infelicities of the file here, but I'm, I'm hoping it's still clear to everybody. 
along the along the vertical axis you will see the words recall application understanding etc etc across the vertical axis basically if, for those of you who know much about the educational assessment field you'll see you'll probably recognize these as being categories that arise out of bloom's taxonomy of education objectives unbelievably perhaps or um, perhaps believably because it's been it's held such value and importance in in the literature over the years that even 60 years later it is possible for us still to go back to some of those schemes what i wanted to why i want to introduce this particular map to you this sort of conceptual table if you like to you at this stage is because i think this helps us to be much clearer about what we're trying to do in assessment terms if for example across the vertical axis the object of our assessment is strongly on in, on enabling students to recall information we are going to ask them fundamentally different questions than we would do if our if our focus were for example on the other end of the scale on review critique and evaluation what i think an online space can help us do very fruitfully is deal with some of these components of learning as part of the formative assessment act, uh, process and on the formative assessment continuum. So if the object of the final assessment is not to have students recall and remember things only, but be able to transform or review or critique, we can make use of the online space for them to remember, recall, and so on, and then for our uh, more summative assessment or more complex assessment to be focused much more on the right-hand side of the scale. On the vertical axis here, I hope I got these columns right. The horizontal axis is the recall application understanding. The vertical, I think I made a, may have made a mistake. The vertical axis here, I'm talking about a focus on the kind of assessment that we are interested in implementing. So the, the top line is the line that says what is the cognitive or affective or behavioral demand that we want. The vertical axis tells it looks at what kinds of assessment do we think is important if our assessment is predominantly a content oriented oriented assessment then what would best enable us to fight to assess the extent to which students have learned content often that is some kind of test or perhaps a, uh, an essay based on a factual essay or something of that kind which is very different from, for example, if we're trying to understand whether students have learned concepts and so on. We would ask very different kinds of questions and we would ask them in very different ways. And we might again want to use an online environment to cover some of the basic forms of assessment uh, in, uh, before getting to may, maybe more complex summative assessment tasks later. The <clears throat> the, the, the two axes, the vertical and the horizontal axes, in my view, they're not. This is not meant to be a lattice. This is not meant to be some kind of um, template. But much rather to say, there's an interplay between what we demand of, of students in assessment terms and the kinds of assessment tasks that we set. So it is a it is a taxonomy, but not to. I'm encouraging people not to see it as some kind of template that one fits to our assessment activity. But much more to say, it could be perhaps a sliding scale. We could also use this kind of um, template for looking at whole curricula, for example, and saying what is it that we, what kinds of assessment activity are we predominantly focused on perhaps at the first year level or at the second year or the third year and so on. Where would we want students to get to in, 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 in say the senior years or the graduate years of, the, of, their, of, their, of their courses? Arguably, we might want them to be on the right-hand side where review, critique, and evaluation are much more foregrounded. But from, a, from an assessment point of view, what is critical here is understanding the differences between these different forms of assessment. Fundamentally, asking questions that expect students to recall are qualitatively different questions from the kinds of questions we would ask if we want students to review or critique or evaluate something. Uh, and then again, back to my first slide all the time, again, I'm back there, is how will we know the difference between recall and review, for example? What will students produce in the way of assessment that will help us to make those distinctions? And how might we be able to encourage and develop those differences in online environments? Again, through things like discussing these criteria openly and, and explicitly with students, workshopping them, 
having the students themselves engage with engaging yeah, with yes, them in chat rooms thought, and forums uh, Alan, and the like, often we so that we can choose get some sense of where students' understanding tool. is in relation and to these sort of components the, of assessment. You know, by Again, that choice of the tool, that these are we are doing the discourse of assessment. Which um, we could actually put up for students with and this have kind them of table debate, discuss, and then choose, about, our, et cetera, et cetera. then choose our tool. Okay, um, I'm going so to take Cheryl one more pause and then sort of press on. A little bit of discussion here in the chat the around webinar. blogs, and then John asked, Anything how do you evaluate or, the blog with, personally? Or looking or at uh, emerging peer, at the moment, Nick. Um, yeah, so I think it's, it's those kinds of bigger questions. If you can, you know, share some Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Okay, my, response, my first response is to say, yes, I have concentrated on design issues more than on uh, sort of recipe type issues, if you like, or skills based issues. So I've said, yes, let's get our thinking right. Let's think about what it is that we're trying to achieve and what the purposes are for doing assessment in the first place before we move to actual platforms and thinking about what those are. So that's and you, you basically have said that in your in your in your first comment now. The, the other point I wanted to make was that, that, yes, it kind of goes back to last week's seminar, that we need to be thinking very carefully about the affordances of particular platforms and what kinds of literacies they demand from students as well as ourselves and what they best lend themselves to. <clears throat> For example, um, having students interact in written form on, in, a, in a blog post on a, in an online environment assumes a certain kind of writing literacy for those students or aims to develop that writing literacy. It assumes also that there's a particular kind of language development that we assume to be in place there too. Perhaps if we believe that the student's language development is part of the uh, or is, is an object of, of the assessment, we might go for some other kind of online um, activity such as perhaps an oral online activity or some kind of um, opportunity for students to demonstrate a process rather than use writing as our major as our major vehicle for assessment. So I think you're absolutely right. We have to be thinking about first of all what is our purpose and and that goes to design and then we have to be thinking quite carefully in what particular environment would it, would my purpose best be achieved and what kinds of I suppose the question is I was talking to a group a couple of weeks back where I said in essence what we're asking with assessment is what does it take for students to be able to respond to a particular assessment activity? And asking that question, I think, helps us to get some sense of not only that they're answering a question, but they're also engaging with a series of literacies. And in the online space, clearly digital literacy is a very important component of their engagement. So it makes little sense to place assessment into an online environment in cases where students are, are unable to say, engage with the medium or the platform in that case. OK, um, I have about five minutes left. I want to move through a couple of other issues before we conclude the, the actual webinar. Uh, and then maybe we do need to think about ways in which people can engage with these issues a little further um, and maybe even create opportunities for people to try out some ideas in some sort of experimental space. I'm not sure about that. I don't know whether that's going to be possible, but, but perhaps it's possible in an offline or not offline space, in a space that is not this webinar. OK, so the design questions I've been trying to stress through the course of the presentation have been these. What is it that we want to assess? And that means inc that includes whether we want to do it in a formative way or in, an, in, or a, or in, a, in a, a summative way. Um, it also includes whether we're assessing knowledge or application or thinking or um, whatever it is. And it also includes things like whether we, our predominant form of assessment is cognitive um, and, and or affective and or behavioral in its orientation. Then the issue which I raised right at the outset, which from, excuse me, from a theoretical point of view, we talk about as constructive alignment. 
How do the assessment activities align with the particular course objectives? And I think we can get a huge amount of feedback in the online space about the extent to which both informal and formal assessment actually does align with what we had intended. Because if we use assessment in a, format, in, a, in a formative sense we can and use it in online spaces, we can very quickly begin to see the pattern that is emerging about the quality of student learning and the extent to which it fits with what we had expected. Key question two is the signals that assessment provides about the course and to students. If we, if we use lots of opportunities for, for, for formative assessment, we signal strongly, I believe, that learning and facilitating learning is a key component of the course. If we, are, if we, if we focus perhaps only on summative assessment, we perhaps create the unintentional signal that uh, summative assessment is all there is and, and that we are encouraging snapshot views of learning rather than, a than seeing learning as a developmental process. And then I've mentioned this point already, the last point on this particular slide, which forms of assessment best suit what we're assessing. For example, if we use multiple choice assessment, it is possible to test levels of thinking, but often multiple choice assessment is based, or is focused quite strongly on, on assessing students' knowledge, um, whereas, for example, case studies enable us to, to assess much more strongly integrated application, knowledge, um, own thinking, uh, the development of thinking from other people and the like. So we need to be thinking all the time about the kinds of assessment you do and what they best suit. So, so for example, online learning as one case might help us to um, produce or, or focus quite strongly on much more social forms of learning or learning which takes place in social settings. I did say last week, I did make an important point from my point of view, is that social learning is not so much about a process of learning, but is, is just telling us something about the context in which, in which learning takes place. So an online platform, for example, can help students to benefit, benefit strongly from one another uh, in terms of their learning, and so it is in a, so in a highly social space. Okay, we're pretty much out of time. I wanted to move on to issues that related to validity. They will be in the slides, so people will be able to, um, to, to, to have a look at those questions that I raise around validity, because validity is a key component, especially in my view, of, of practicing assessment, social practice, uh, practice of assessment in online spaces. Um, again, it's back to what are we actually assessing? If it is that students are um, very comfortable with online spaces of learning, it is possible that we advantage those students more than the students who are not comfortable with that kind of assessment. So I suppose the challenge is making sure that our assessment is multi-dimensional and also multi-format if we're going to be closer, get closer towards validity issues. The final bit of my presentation, which I'm not going to get to today, deals with the issues of rubrics and what rubrics enable us to do and, and what particular value rubrics have and where they are particularly uh, possibly limited. I think the key point I was making in this particular webinar was to say that rubrics can be placed in online settings and can form the, can become part of formative assessment. In other words, they can provide feedback to students about what, what the ways in which they can respond to particular tasks. And of course, there can be rubrics about writing as much as there can be rubrics about oral assessment or group process, or for that matter, rubrics in, that students develop for themselves as a basis for making judgments about their own learning. Thank um, you very, I've very much, Alan, for those, quite promising uh, for today's very engaging seminar. In, 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 and I think you've given uh, us a lot of food for thought with and things to think about. Things to think about um, set the objects of their own learning and create rubrics of that learning that, against which they can informal, make judgments about their, themselves. Um, so thank okay, you very much for that. I'm going to have to stop there, I'm afraid, because we are out of time. Facebook event page. So it's just gone two minutes past two o'clock. But let's keep the discussion going on our Facebook event page. So there's a link a little bit higher up in the text chat, or else you'll probably, if you've signed up, you'll find it on, on Facebook. Uh, when you search for Emerge Africa. Yeah, I think it would be a really nice idea if we should perhaps share our rubrics for online assessments, perhaps uh, processes, um, processes that led to your choice of tool, um, maybe your design principles that you engage in when designing online assessments. So yes, 
feel free to share whatever you want to share and to discuss further. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time out um, to attend today's session. Uh, we really uh, appreciate it and always enjoy engaging with you all. Have a great day, everyone.